Okay, welcome to the Endo meeting. Today is May 31st of 2023. The, uh, our agenda is light today, and because it is light, I have chosen to steal all of the time. <laughs> um, uh, I've been working on a prototype for, for some time for the Endo Executor Demon, which is uh, uh, intended to be a basis for um, running sandboxed applications on behalf of a user agent sort of like a web uh, like a web browser for hardened javascript um and the idea is for it to also serve as a sort of peer-to-peer backend system so you can write peer-to-peer -peer software where one peer is serving content and serving application state and behavior on behalf of their peers um so to that end the uh, I've put up a design document that you may all look at with me as soon as I've got it pulled up. It is in a very rough form. I have not responded to any of the excellent feedback I've received out of band yet, uh, but that's that's my intention today. Um, and I will share my screen. Yeah, and I will, uh, yeah, I'll drop this link in chat and change this to the document, the readable form. Um, there are no diagrams. The basic, Mark asked me, well, I suggested to Mark and Mark agreed that the next steps for this project are not so much about code, but so much, uh, more about coming to an agreement on the abstract design. Um, and one of the pieces of feedback from, from Dan in particular is that it is too abstract and it would be great to do a graduated introduction with examples, which I think is the next step. Um, but the, the general idea is that uh, Agoric runs a whole bunch of technology on chain that goes a lot farther than just eventual send. And we really want to create uh, a tool. Among other things, we want to create a tool that folks can use to get experience with eventual send, even if they're not willing to pay for determinism or orthogonal persistence. And, um, and it also is beneficial to have a foundation for orthogonal persistence that's based on manual persistence because of problems of liveliness when you restart. Um, the idea is that with this system, uh, you would be able to refer. We, so for one, it's a pet name system. So the idea is to present a user interface to the user so that they can make decisions about what capabilities the guest program can do in terms of the pet names that they have assigned to capabilities. Those pet names can refer to a number of things. What to name those things is a point of contention. <laughs> and uh, we've been going back and forth on, uh, on uh, uh, apropos of the people in the room, one of the ideas that I considered was calling these things resources. Um, but, but the term resources become somewhat muddy um, in the wake of uh, uh the web confusing what W3C intended for the term resource as in URL um, and how rest it's it got confused over time. So resource is not a great word. Um, I'm proposing that we use the term recipe. Uh, I have talked a lot and I have not been talking in any specific direction. I imagine that a lot of people are confused at this point. So can I open to questions to help me direct where, where my explanation goes next? I have a comment, which is that I have a specific example of this, which we might want to look at after you get through this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me just say let, uh, before we turn over to dan that this is an idea that is inspired by git and content address stores uh, in the sense that they're in git you have objects and references in this system 
and, and in Git, objects are an immutable content address store and references are essentially like pet names to things that exist in the content address store. Um, and those things in Git's parlance are analogous to the resources or recipes that I'm talking about in Endo. Um, except that instead of talking about trees and files and, uh, and, and, and file system type things, we're talking about values in JavaScript and how to construct them based off of their dependencies. Um, and with that, uh, Dan has been fiddling around with the prototype that I hacked together before I went on paternity leave. Um, and uh, uh, let's let me give my screen to you. Uh, you're in audible, Dan. Sound check. You're here. Okay. So we're interested in having our tech talk to the sprightly folks over a cap DP. And that's how this idea got started, but it, uh, it's a chat thingy. Hey, <laughs> um, and the, Endo app part of it is over here on the right of this little design diagram. So Alice is using this uh, web page, um, and then the um, the Endo app has a plugin for doing web sockets, and then the rest of the of the Endo app talks to uh, the plugin, and so that's all the whole thing fits together. Um, and then I think I might have it running on my desktop, but Fortunately, I have, you know, I brought slides, um, so I don't have to try to do a live demo. Anyway, so if you endo reset, that that um, uh, resets the content address store, right? Yeah, okay. So that's like, you know, nothing up my sleeve. <clears throat> and then I just, there's these uh, endo, there's a command line interface for endo, and I um, scripted it using a make file. Um, so one of the things you can do is spawn a worker, um, and I called it Echo Worker. And I think that means that Echo Worker is now a pet name for uh, a worker process. He's nodding. Yeah. All right. Um. Then there's this thing that has a funky name because it's, it's and that's sort of on purpose because we're still trying to decide if it's a good thing to do. Um. But there's this, well, in this case, it's it's supposed to be a confined app. It's not supposed to be an unsafe thing, but I don't think we have the confined version of the command available yet. So I used the unconfined import widget. Anyway, so this says well, in the there, echo work. There, like is, there is a confined version now, but uh, that's, that's not important. It's effect, effectively the same. It okay. looks the same. Right. Okay, so in the... Uh, uh, Worker process known as Echo Worker. Um, take this uh, Echo.js thing and bundle it. And um, do we also evaluate it, or do we just bundle it? I'm sorry. Um, the uh, in the import unsafe. There's no bundle. Oh. But in, in the confined version, a bundle does get stored so that it can be recreated on the next run. Uh, the unsafe version is is um, just a, uh, captures the locate the fully qualified path on the file system of the plugin, um, and the expectation is that the same thing will be there next time it runs. But with bundles, the code is actually captured and guaranteed to be the same next time you run. Okay. Well, something got evaluated because. Yes. Yeah, that that's that it just it Im, it imported the module and gave, okay. gave you a space object. Um and if we look at that real quick. Oh not not the namespace object. It gives you the the there's a calling convention. Your your module has to main have to have a main function and the main function has to return a far object. And so you got the far object out of the plugin. Right. 
And so, to be clear, the the program will look the same when it's confined. Right. Okay. So um, a far object is one we expect to be able to reach from other bats. Um, so there we've got our echo service um, evaluated, that, and it's called echo service. That far object is the thing that we're that I'm proposing we call a resource or proposed yeah. in the combined document and we need yeah, a better no, Thank you. Anyway, okay. <laughs> right. I'm, it, it's not sticking with me. Anyway, far object, it's pretty clearly a far object. Anyway. Um, okay. So then I make another, I spawn another uh, worker process and call it socket worker. And in that case, I lo lo load in this, um, this web socket device and I call it socket dev. And in that case, it probably matters that it's unsafe because it's going to do things like talk to the network and stuff. It's going to use node APIs, which you can't do if you're a confined thing. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, a confined thing has to request, uh, must request all powers from the user. The user mediates all of those choices. With, with an unconfined program, it just gets everything. Right. So this WebSocket thing is, is unconfined. And then um, I asked Endo to evaluate in the socket worker, um, e socket dev make server 8080 and socket dev gets um, the pet name socket dev is made available in the uh, static scope of this evaluation. And then the result of that evaluation, we're calling it WebSocket or WSS8, WebSocket Server 8 or something like that. Okay, and then what comes back is an alleged WebSocket server. Uh, and then we make another eventual call, start on echo service, start on that server. Um, and we call that one, Did I give it a name? It looks what? like you, it looks like you did not, but okay. uh, yeah, WebSocket service, yeah. Okay, and at that point, um, I visit you know visit eighty eighty, and I type it hello, and then uh, that sends it over from the somebody. I'm not sure. If, yeah, the web page uh, makes a call. It, it goes over the. WebSocket gets to the chat application, which <laughs> echoes it back. Sorry, yeah, the, the trivial chat application echo, echoes it back and shows up in the screen up there. So what we have here is a demonstration that we have connectivity all the way from a web page to a worker that is presumably confine, confinable um, inside, of the, inside of the executor. Right. So there's a concrete version of this thing. Now, if you want to talk about the design document for the generalization yeah Talk so yeah so that's where we are are there questions about the functionality we're at so far no i, th I think that looks really really cool and really interesting though for what it's worth <laughs> yeah I'm looking forward to playing um, around with it yeah the the next steps there are many next steps <laughs> um but the um one of the next steps is actually to make this this much of the demo much a little bit easier um by making um it, it occurred to me last week that we could do something that ipfs already does and that is to stand up web server and virtual host on the local host subdomains um in order to give a single uh, to give a, a a separate origin to every confined front end so what we can do what we can do with the next phase of this project is have the endo daemon stand up a web server and if you uh, visit a uuid dot localhost colon some port it would serve up the content associated with so the uuid would be a reference to both um it, it would be a reference into endo's resource tree so to speak for now 
um, which captures both a bundle of code to run in the front end and also capture um, the the uh, a reference to the power box that the that the web page should have access to through which it can request additional permissions. And then what would happen is that the web page would be hosted from the bundle with whatever with, with whatever web content is is in that bundle, um, which might just be a zip file with an HTML file in it or whatever, or just hosted off of IPFS or something like that. Um, but the thing that's special is that it would have uh, that the that the bootstrap uh, the bootstrap for the web page would include a bit that establishes a CAPTP connection through a web socket on the same host uh, to the power box hosted by Endo, and then therefore and there thereby um, Endo can have front ends can host front ends itself instead of having to reach out to a um, uh, a plugin. Basically, the plugin should be part of Endo proper. Um, and that would be presumably how we host the initial version of the permission management user interface for Endo itself, right? So there would be a web page where requests from dApps, if you will, would be able to, uh, would, would surface to the user in a web page um, where they could grant or deny a capability by either giving it the pet named object that was requested or not. Um, that's where we are. So the idea for permission management in Endo is to have something like a chat-like user interface with a page with all of the, the, uh, the, the requests from demons or from, from workers where the user can either uh, give a capability or not. I wonder how much of Sandstorm we're, we're rebuilding. Probably a decent chunk of it. We're coming from the same ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm not doing that Sandstorm does do, for one, I'm not coupling to Meteor. <laughs> I'm coupling to CAPTP, not Meteor. Um, and the other thing is that the workers are confined by JavaScript and not confined by LXG or whatever it was. Yeah. Which is to say that our confined programs can't be Rust unless they're running in WebAssembly, or for example. And I and, they can and be. This, yes, and this doesn't have to have a supervisor, uh, pardon, a hypervisor. You don't need a hypervisor to run this. Which brings us even closer to my question about service discovery, because these are words that happen to coincide sometimes. Uh, is there a plan for any sort of service discovery uh, where you wouldn't have to manually bootstrap everything to find out about each other? Uh, well, so there are two answers to that question. For one, um, Mark will say, if, if Mark were in this room, he would say service discovery is an anti-pattern because it, it removes the user from making decisions about what powers are granted to things. Um, I think that that is true. It would also be kind of reasonable for there to be a service by some name that provides like a toolbox of common things that most applications can be safely given. Um, that's... Hmm. Maybe, uh, but really the answer is that this is a pet name system and the, the mitigation for the tedium of bootstrap, my, in, the intention for, my intention is for resolving the tedium of bootstrapping an application being resolved by not removing the tedium, but removing the possibility of harassment when the when the whenever you need to restart the program. So my the Endo is designed to capture the user's decisions, so that if you restart Endo, um, and then load off a user interface, all of the capabilities that were previously granted by the user and not since revoked would be restored. Uh, 
I have okay, not. That sounds right. Uh, okay. And then if we have a uh, if we have a chat app that uh, happens to have a bunch of components like we saw, but orders of magnitude more, um, would it make sense to have instead of a make file have a program that's capable of bootstrapping everything else and linking things up and passing the right uh, pet names where necessary while the user keeps getting asked about permissions? Uh, yes, I mean, it is. Uh, so one of the next steps for the design is to reify the notion of a power box so that power boxes can be created out of other power boxes, et cetera. Um, and that is important because one of the, like introducing third parties and meet and creating power boxes to mediate for the requests of those third parties is sort of fundamental to the design. So for example, if, um, one of the resources or recipes or whatever we end up calling it is, um, connectivity to MetaMask, for example, um, connectivity to MetaMask would come in the form of uh, like a pub sub for here's the bootstrap object for the MetaMask plugin whenever it comes up. Um, and then anybody who wants to connect to MetaMask would subscribe to that and get the get a reference whenever on a MetaMask instance opens. Um, part of, in order for Endo to be able to mediate permission requests from MetaMask, it needs to be fundamental to the system that any connection to MetaMask uh, receive a power box for it to interact, uh, for where it can use that in order to get references to other parts of the system that are mediated by the user, right? Um, for that, I need a primitive that says, hey, I need a new power box and this is what I want. Uh, and, and then, and then to be able to give a name to that power box so that the, the user sees uh, MetaMask by a pet name is asking for this versus uh, something that doesn't have a pet name asking for the same resource, <laughs> um, which is far more suspicious and probably wouldn't even surface to the user. Um, the uh, and then so consequently. Yeah, having having a mechanism for bootstrapping a power box is, is fundamental. Um, the the same mechanism would use be used for establishing peer to peer connections, right? So if I have a peer to peer connection to ZB's Endo, um, I would give it a pet name like here's ZB, uh, and then any request from ZB would be surfaced in the permission management user interface saying, "Hey, ZB wants access to something of this kind. Please name." an instance in your in your um in your local store uh, of powerful objects and as much as possible uh there's a bunch of user interface gestures where people don't even know that they're being accessed ask security questions you know there's file dialogue and drag and drop and all those kinds of things mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah starting with pet names and then building up on top of that is the idea like some of the user interface affordances that we could make is like um, token-based user interface where, uh, or, or forms even, where you can just drag and drop things into slots. It's like, hey, here's my drawer with all of my powerful objects that I am, that I'm responsible for managing or means to create new ones, like a truded file system, for example, or whatnot. And then you just, you can drag and drop or given that drag and drop is kind of not vote is, is not a thing on mobile there. Right. There has to be um, something like a select box or a token view where you type in your pet name. That kind, of, there, yeah. What? A, yeah. A user interface for giving for granting a capability, um, and it also uh, just giving information like answering an input request is also something I expect the uh, the holder of a power box to power box to be able to do or to send a message that just contains a message and possibly some powers, right? So if I'm the MetaMask application, I should be in a position to say, um, please give the user this power and here's what I call it as a suggestion. And then the user gets that and then can adopt the name or not. 
or ask a question like, how tall are you, right? In which case they're not expecting a power at all. It's just input. I wonder, about, uh, I wonder about icons as pet names too. Yeah, pet icons are kind of critical because one of the things that we want, we, we definitely need a pet name system that is also a pet icon system. And that will be especially obvious when we start to interact with NFTs, right? Giving a pet name to an NFT and then having its generated, its corresponding pet icon generated or suggested for the user to adopt. Um, yeah, the, one of the things so, that might NFT be... would be a pet named resource uh, in that case, and yeah, pet, pet names refer to resources. Resources refer to how to create that value or connect to that value. So, in the case of an NFT on the Agoric chain, um, what it would what it would amount to is um, a resource that describes how to connect to the corresponding object that the NFT represents on the chain. Um, and, and then where is the responsibility for manipulating that? Because this is a good example of something, <clears throat> I can't say real, it's an NFT, but it's <laughs> uh, a, a very specific use case uh, where it's easier to reason about it. So where would the responsibility for uh, selling it off or proving ownership lie? Yes. So what an NFT is on the Agoric chain is not just a JPEG. It's not yeah. just an, an autographed JPEG. Uh, we're, yeah, I understand. There's, there's some terminology that we need to establish. An NFT on the Agoric chain can specifically be an e-write NFT, right? And that those are the objects that I'm talking about. That's, that is to say an NFT that represents the right to interact with a particular API object and transfer of ownership of an NFT is effectively revocation of that access for the previous holder and transfer to the new holder. So having a reference to the NFT isn't sufficient. You also have to have ownership in order to send a message, right? Wow, uh, that's that's the idea anyway. Possession is ten tenths of the law around here. <laughs> if you have a, if you have a reference to it, you're gold. You have it. Yeah, um, until you're disconnected, right? Over CAPTP, um, at which point the connection needs to be reestablished. Okay. This is a point where I become in trouble and need Mark to help me navigate where the distinction is. Okay. You're right that possession is 10 tenths, but revocability is also very important for our model. Um, and revocability can occur in multiple ways. Uh, I haven't figured out what that is for endo resources yet, but it's definitely something that has to be done. Oh, okay. Well, because for ERTP, the, the, um, the asset is sort of not a JavaScript object because after you've spent a payment, you still have the JavaScript object, but there's a payment ledger out there that says that yeah. your JavaScript object isn't worth anything anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, the exact details are, are, I do not have the exact details on how this would work, but essentially have only the, uh, the, the emergent effect must be one where owning an NFT corresponds to the ability to interact with some corresponding object. Right. Well, in, in, what goes on in the Agoric blockchain these days is there's mm -hmm. these uh, payments that go around and then you you um, trade in the payment, you, you make an offer <clears throat> and you get this offer result back. And that usually is your, your right to the, the object that you can actually use to vote or whatever the heck. Mm -hmm. And then in some of our contracts, you can trade that object back for an invitation if you want to do exclusive transfer to sell it to somebody else. And so when there's you these, these things that are duels of each other. Yeah, so when you do that, the object that you previously held before you transferred it in, tra traded it in for an invitation, um, becomes revoked in right. some fashion. Yeah, yeah. inert, yeah. Inert, yeah. So so one, one of the ways that we can do that is with a handled promise or promise delegate. And a handled promise is in a position where it can say, it can forward messages to the underlying powerful object until it's revoked. 
And I don't recall whether that's how we do it on chain, but that's one of the mechanisms that we have available to us. Which, which is popping into my head is from inter protocol, which I realize is kind of an implementation of it and might, might be really specific, but yeah, that you can transfer your vault to a new owner. So, you know, after calling transfer invitation or whatever the invitation name is, uh, yeah, at the end of that transaction, you have transferred your vault to a new owner. So you'll no longer have, uh, yeah, references to the invitations that you had references to prior to that. Or they won't be good for anything. Yeah, that sounds about right. ZB, have I answered your question at this point? I'm not competent to be sure, but right. it was a lot of uh, relevant information uh, and more. <laughs> right. oh, can, can you repeat your question so that I can make sure that we've answered it well? Um, well, so I wanted to know if uh, if you could explain where the responsibility uh, would lie for interactions with uh, the token. So if there is an interaction, an action you want to perform on a resource, oh. uh, on this specific example, I thought it would be easier to uh, explain, uh, is that is the implementation of that uh, residing somewhere with the object for which you have the reference or is that implementation um, elsewhere, like in a, uh, in a different piece of code somewhere else uh, under a different pet name? So there's wow. a contract involved. There's an object representing the NFT, which has something to do with the contract anyway. So how would you how would you get to that? Yeah, um, going going from end to end to an NFT. Uh, I don't have answers for all of this, but what I can say is that the pet name is highly local. The pet name refers to the pet names are your names and. Um, that they designate, uh, they designate a recipe for constructing a value on your endo instance, right? Um, those values and the paths to then those construction paths are in that you own, right? But what the recipes describe um, is uh, one of either uh, how to get a bag of bytes that you have stored on your machine. Um, that persists, or how to get uh, how to get a uh, a value given some other values by running code on your machine, um, and how to connect to a bootstrap object that exists remotely, right? Um, and getting and what what that entails is some version of CAPTP that would get you a reference that's remote and whatever um, whatever integrity checking is necessary to do that, like usually that involves having the public key of your interlocutor, your whomever you're speaking to um, and, uh, and which CAPTP protocol that you're going to use to connect to it. In the case of connecting to the Agoric chain, that would be provided by a plugin, um, which, is an, uh, which is basically what we have in the AG solo today um, what in the future would just be con connecting to a smart wallet on our chain. And what that amounts to is a plugin that is able to submit transactions to our chain and receive responses back. Um, and the level of abstraction that we provide is that, yes, you're using the chain as a message bus for, for sending eventual send messages to the chain, what you get back is a local object that represents the remote object, right? So what Endo is producing is a proxy for uh, 
for, for a connection to an, a remote object. And that remote object exists on the chain in our case. From another angle, there's kind of two patterns. One is when you have an object, you can call methods on it. And the other thing you can do in a, with an object is use its identity to look it up in a table or something like that. Um, so our payments, we tend to use them to look them up in a table. Um, they don't have any interesting methods on them themselves. So anyway, that, that's sort of, sort of a, so the, the question of, you know, if I run the recipe again, do I get the same object it becomes <laughs> a very complicated question with like distributed garbage collection and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, equality and identity are an interesting topic, <laughs> but, but the, the real, the, but the, but the effect the necessary effect is that you get an object that communicates that sends messages to a particular ultimate destination and there can be multiple legs of connectivity right a remote object like if you were to get a reference to a remote promise that promise could be resolved with a remote of the remote and then you have a multi-leg message chain from remote to remote to potentially remote etc Looking forward to a cycle. Cycles can happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, and cycles can be problematic in the distributed semantics without um, but third three party handoff. If we were if we get to the point where we have a cap TP with three party handoff, which to be clear, sprightly already does, um, three party handoff makes it possible to shorten um, to shorten a chain. Over time, and if the and if if you do have a cycle and three party handoff, eventually those cycles become trivial, as and and you can easily detect them locally. Um, promise implementation: the early promise implementations did not have cycle detection, but they do. It is possible to construct promise resolution cycles. Um, the newest promise implementations do um, shorten their references and can tell when they've when they've bottomed out on a cycle and and turn into rejected their rejected promises Re rejected promises of the error that there was a cycle makes me want to trigger that now because I don't recall seeing one yet <laughs> yeah um. Q version two had a cycle detector. I actually don't know if native does it yet. They they probably do, but I haven't tried. The neat thing is that I I believe all forms of data lock bottom out in cyclic promise resolution. So I'm more than satisfied with the answer. I'm gonna to need to listen cool. to it again to process everything. Yeah, and and when you're listening to it, no doubt Mark will be listening to it. And please correct me where I was wrong, Mark. <laughs> whenever you show, whenever you're watching this recording, please correct me where I was wrong. Uh, one more comment that I have is uh, a role of a DevRel for this platform is going to be super demanding. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's that's actually part of the reason for having Endo uh, is that for Agoric, the dev role is all of this. Uh, explaining it, the, uh, for an Agoric dev role is responsible for explaining everything up to here. And then more. <laughs> Good thing we got Diego. Yeah, and and it's actually really quite heartening. Thomas has been using the whole stack for some time now, and if someone is able to understand everything, that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, well, I I I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm I'm making an attempt to. You know, uh, you know, I don't want to act like I'm mastered it all but hey dan's been along he's been holding my hand kind of along the the way so 
Yeah. Well, the and, neat thing, the neat thing about this is that it's very similar to the problems that we've already seen before. Explaining promises to people who didn't, had never seen promises before is extremely difficult. Explaining promises today is pretty easy. It's like, hey, you put these things together and it looks and it, and it works. <laughs> it does what it looks like it would do. And um, yeah, I, when, I, when most of the people in the tribe understand it, then you feel like you you're obliged to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, there comes a point where there are more people who understand it than not and helping hands are easier to get in touch with i'm not sure how deep like uh we and I, by we i mean really the agoric developer community has gone uh, in on yeah just eventual send and handled promise i'm actually kind of curious about that um yeah well, in terms of explanation uh yeah explanation kind of exploring what's uh yeah yeah what's possible I, yeah at the moment we don't really treat eventual send as a distinct uh as a distinct topic do we um that sort of underpins everything that we do but uh the Gork docs talk about eventual send explicitly yeah yeah It'll be it, neat. it doesn't talk about the implementation with Tam Promise and stuff. Ah, yeah. That's yeah, I don't think it down in the basement. That, you know, if I went down there one time, and uh, if I never have to go back, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was going to say it doesn't necessarily really need to, you know, as long as you have it, work I did, knowledge. Yeah. I did write... Uh, I did write a document and so I wrote a promise library called Q, which we don't use, but it sort of provides a, a, a view of early promises in JavaScript and it did support eventual send. And there is a design.md file in the Q repository that explains how you would build up a promise library from nothing in pure JavaScript, including why its promises in JavaScript are shaped the way they are in order to facilitate eventually getting all the way down to an implementation of eventual send. And what it does is it explains that um, a promise implementation, um, a promise instance is backed by a handle and that handle, and there are different types of handles. The ones that are obvious that you understand already are a fulfilled handle versus a rejected handle versus a deferred handle and the case of and the idea is that messages follow the resolution path of promises down to a terminal handle like fulfilled or settled right so if you're saying i'm awaiting on this promise that's a message to a promise um that that yeah. says hey promise please let me know when you can get to a terminal state either to a fulfilled state or to a rejected state and there's what Q does is it tells you that there are there's another type of handle, which is to say a, a user implementation of a handle. Um, and the user mode implementation of a handle is able to forward those messages that are sent to promises to an arbitrary implementation. And that's how you get CAPTP uh, to participate in the promise graph. You create, you create a handle implementation that instead of um, instead of doing any of those other things, it serves as a sort of asynchronous proxy and then funnels all of the messages that were sent to the promise off to the remote and all of the responses back to the whomever uh, requested them. Uh, and it serves as a sort of membrane. Every time you interact with a promise that is remote, you get a new promise that is also handled as a remote promise for whatever the eventual result is. Um, yeah, I can, I can share. Uh, I can share a link to that document. I think that it was for people who are interested in how the whole tower is built on top of, of, of something primitive. It, it explains that. Uh, yeah. One thing you said there uh, kind of suggested that it is possible for a promise to have other intermediate steps, uh, states that are not terminal uh, mm -hmm. is, is that still a possibility? I don't yeah. think they ever had. Uh, I mean, in implementations. Uh, in native, 
native promise implementations don't do that. That's why we have our own handled promise abstraction built on top of them. But Cube had it all built in at the bottom layer. How much of handled promise is supposed to disappear into the engines? All of it. Okay. Um, yeah, our intention is to propose a promise.delegate or yes, promise.delegate is a method to the JavaScript promise constructor that would allow you to provide a handle, handle implementation. Um, and then, uh, and then just promises can be remote period from that point forward can refer to remote objects. Uh, By I'm propose, do you mean a TC39 propose? Yes. Yeah, we are, uh, Agoric is proposing that TC, uh, uh, an, uh, as part of our decades long attempt to get eventual send into the language, we, uh, um, we, in, we have, I believe we have an open proposal at probably stage one for uh, handled promises. I haven't seen it in a long time because we're not pushing it particularly hard. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's one of it's one of those things that uh, it will be easier to push when some people have seen it in the wild, and they won't see it in the wild until there's something like Endo for them to fiddle around with it. Well, but basically, a lot of people do not realize that it solves a problem that they have already. Um, and there are many, many instances of people solving the same problem in different ways. If you look at the web driver for Selenium, it's essentially an implementation of eventual send, um, but uh, but it's all callback but based. Broken. Yeah, and, I, I, I regard it as as the um, as finishing the job that putting promises in JavaScript was the first step of. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to explain local synchrony, local synchronization with promises, but 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 almost to a first approximation in the world that I came out of, the local case is this special case that almost never comes up that you it's not even worth paying attention to. It's the it's the distributed case, which is why you want this feature in the language in the first place. And so it's been very uh, tricky trying to communicate with people who, um, first uh, encounter with promises was is in the, the strictly local case, and that's the the only world they know. I think okay. Michael was the custodian of the handled promise thing uh, as of the last time we did anything with it. Yeah. And you send in a proposal, like a, a web page to, to what I think I, I think it's that proposal. It, it, yeah, you got it. Um, if you want to fiddle with the pet demon and its very primitive exploratory state, um, I'm pretty sure that none of this code will land um, in its current form. It will probably be. I will probably um be rewriting it um or at least refactoring it continuously into a shape where it can land there are a number of things that have to happen before it can land one of which is getting some uh getting agorix pub sub package moved into the endo repository so that i can rely upon it for the powerbox inbox api that's not urgent um so i'm going to continue fiddling with this on a branch for a while um, and that is the branch that you can check out in order to, uh, for example, reproduce what Dan built um, for chat and to follow along. I'll just be periodically updating this reference. Um, yeah, uh, and if and I think that everyone here knows where to find us, um, either on Matrix or in Slack. My preference at this point is to do as much in Matrix as possible to invite um, participation from people who are not employed by Agoric or MetaMask. Yeah, I like that idea a lot, but nothing seems to pull me there. So, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> my, I haven't crossed that, that bridge in my sort of workflow yet. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it's hot in there, Dan. You should check on it frequently. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, Exclusive content. If you have a question, you, you definitely, definitely don't want to miss out. You definitely should be afraid of missing out on what's going on in Matrix. Can I get can I connect to it from, a, from an Indo app? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is number one, the number one question. When do we replace? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, you can connect to it from an Indo app. Go ahead and write the app. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, application number one is definitely Endo Chat. Um, so, oh, I did write um, uh, uh, what's the werewolf in in Monty one time. I should port that over. Ooh, yeah, yeah. This idea. class of this class of frameworks we we we, we all like to play with. Um, uh, Multi user chat is sort of the hello world of that yeah. universe. Yeah, and yeah, multi user chat was the hello world for Node. <laughs> a long time ago <laughs> um yeah uh and uh, yeah werewolf and asymmetric information games in general are probably a really great really great demonstration i had not thought of that but that's obvious i had thought of chess but i hadn't thought or rochambeau for that matter those are really easy to get out the door <laughs> um but werewolf is not that much harder huh and a whole lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes a really great demonstration of Monty. It's really, it, you know, every, all, all the data structures and everything too. It's really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. We I guess we to... have all those data structures. Yeah. The I really... Pattern language and stuff. Yeah. When I, I used to run game night for Uber and we were strangely fixated on, on um, lie to your friends games. Um, I'm not sure that it improved our relationships, but <laughs> it's not strange to me. They're they're, they're very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think that that, uh, that we're out of time. Um, thank you for listening to me ramble about uh, about en Endo for the last hour, and I hope to um, keep you all interested as we go. All right. Ciao. Thank you.